The title of the message tonight is What the Kingdom of God is Like. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the instruction that has come out of Mark 4 this morning as you instructed your disciples. And I pray as we conclude these final thoughts that you would sharpen our understanding, both of our mission and our responsibility in that mission. Help us to see how the kingdom of God grows and what it's like so that we can be involved, engaged in your work on earth. And uh, Lord, I pray that you bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, baby. Seated. <clears throat> now, we do have some from Emerald City Baptist Church and some that might have not been able to be here this morning. So a little bit of review is in order, and that's my style anyway. I don't know how to preach without a little review. It's just the way I do it. But if you remember how we got to Mark chapter 4, it will greatly enhance your understanding on why Jesus is teaching these things about his kingdom. Leading up to Mark 4, Jesus' ministry is blossoming. People know who he is. And in Mark chapter 4, you see this really strange mix of response to that ministry that Jesus has started. First of all, there's a multitude. When you begin to heal people and miraculously feed people and speak with authority as no one has ever spoken with authority, you gain a crowd, and a crowd was there. And there was a multitude of people that were truly following him and believed that he was the Messiah. There were some genuine followers. But amongst the genuine followers, Jesus also had friends that looked at the life of Jesus and had a different take on his ministry. And Many of his friends looked at him and said he is beside himself. Another word that he is out of his mind. He is here, but his mind is here. He's beside himself. He, he's out of his mind. I, I mean, their, their, their opinion of Jesus was this is crazy. What you're doing is crazy. This is not good for you. You're, you're crazy to, to, to go on like this. He's beside himself. That's his friend's opinion. And then you have the Pharisees the wonderful Pharisees, the religious crowd, if anyone should be receiving the Messiah, the miracle-working Messiah, who spoke with authority, it should be the Pharisees, but they rejected him. You know what their, their attitude was? Their opinion was, I'll tell you why there's such a big crowd here, he hath Beelzebub. That was their opinion. <laughs> I'll tell you why you got the big crowd here. You got the big crowd because Satan's giving you power and, and you are the scum of the earth and that's why you're gathering all the scum of the earth around you because you got the devil in you. Man, not, not the kind of response you would expect. But to me, the worst still came from his own family. His, his mother and his brothers and sisters, they came to him and we, we, we don't take the time to preach, re-preach that from Mark 3, but their attitude to their own Brother and son was, look, I know what you're doing is important, but you got your priorities out of order. You really need to put your family first and your health first, and, 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 and this is too much. And that was the opinion of his family. Okay, so if, if you're looking on the outside, or even if you're one of the disciples, and you're trying to gauge how was the ministry of Jesus doing, what do you, what do you gain from that? He's getting really mixed responses People are not responding the way that at least the disciples thought they would. Do you know how the disciples thought people would respond to Jesus? The same way they did. Do you know how you and I particularly expect people to respond to the gospel? Well, the same way I did, right? Here's what happened when I heard that there was a Savior willing to forgive my sins. Here's how I responded. Well, great. I need that because I'm a sinner. That's really good news, and I'm happy about it. <laughs> you know, and is that not how you expect people to respond? Because being a sinner is so obvious, and the need of a Savior is so obvious, and here he is. It's like, man, this is the way everybody ought to respond, but everybody doesn't respond that way. And now the disciples have to carry on in Jesus' footsteps, and they're trying to gauge, how's, how's the kingdom of God doing? Is this the plan? Everyone's not responding the way I thought they would. And so Jesus began to speak in parables. And in teaching in parables, he takes heavenly ideas, such as how his kingdom on earth is going to work, 
and he puts them in visual word pictures so that you and I can understand them. That is what Mark chapter 4 is all about. And you can see that as he says in, in uh, verse 2, And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken. Then he begins his first parable, Behold, there went out a sower to sow. And he begins to teach. So that people would know what his kingdom is all about. Do you know what God's kingdom is like? It's a lot like farming. Not because I've never farmed. I mean, I don't know personally. But that's what Jesus said. And those were the first illustrations he gave. He says the kingdom of God is a lot like farming. And he began in verses 3 through 20 and expressed in God's kingdom. It's the condition of the soil of the heart, not the seed or the sower, that makes the difference and how the message is received. Because people are wondering, they're looking at this, and why, why do the multitudes love him? The Pharisees hate him. His friends think he's crazy, and his family thinks he got his priorities out of line. Why? It's the condition of the heart. That's the, that's the problem. It's not the sower, and it's not the seed. It's not the word of God. It's the soil of the heart. In God's kingdom, it's the condition of the soil of the heart. Not the seed or the sower that makes all the difference in how the message is received. And then this morning in the main service in verses 21 through 25, we learn this. In God's kingdom, his servants have one responsibility. Sow the seed and leave the rest to God. That's it. In God's kingdom is a lot like farming. God's kingdom is a lot like farming. And it has a lot to do with the soil. And our job is to sow. That's it. <clears throat> and once more, Jesus is about... To show us what God's kingdom is like. And for this reason. As his disciples observe the mixed response Jesus is getting. And the baffling rejection from those they thought would receive him as king. They had a hard time evaluating how God's kingdom was doing. I mean you can, you can kind of feel the attitude in the air. Right? How is God's kingdom doing? Was it growing? Was it healthy? Were they doing something wrong? Was it strong? Was it weak? Was it irrelevant? Would God's kingdom conquer or be conquered? I mean, these are valid questions. Were they gaining ground or losing it? Have you ever looked at the kingdom of God that you're involved in and wondered the same thing? I mean, look, we can talk about the church right now and the atmosphere of the church, but let's just talk about your own personal life. Are we gaining ground or are we losing ground? Are we growing? Are we conquering or being conquered? Is my testimony working? Is my family growing spiritually? Come on, you, you know these things. We could talk about the, the health of the church. Uh, you know, we, we, we had a visitor today. That was fantastic. It's been a while. Are we growing? Right? Are we moving forward? Are we gaining strength? They're becoming weaker. How's the kingdom of God doing? See, it's not easy judging the kingdom of God by what you can see. Not much has changed. Not much has changed in 2,000 years. It's still that way. It's hard to judge the kingdom of God by what you can see. AJ was just discussing a problem with me. Before church, so pastor, we got three people and I'm struggling with how to set up the church so that people walk in and don't instantly feel discouraged. <laughs> you know, like we, we want to set it up to where it's inviting, you know, so like, oh, how do we do that? You know, do we, you know, probably shouldn't set up 20 chairs. Let's set up 10, you know, and talking about arranging it in different ways. And because we want people to come in and feel like there's growth there. You know, it's, it's really hard to judge how God's kingdom is doing in West Seattle through AJ by what you see. And it's still hard by what you see here. After 14 years, the question I hate getting the most from other pastors is, so how are you guys doing? <laughs> how do we answer that? I don't know. You know, it's like I'm not exactly sure what to say. Next week we get to baptize uh, 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 Rich Divine. He's going to get baptized right out here. How cool is that? He's in his 80s. He came to me. He wants to get baptized. I'm totally pumped about that. And then he's moving to Texas. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, it's like, 
takes us so long to get them. Like, what's the deal with that? What's, is, are we growing or shrinking? You know what I'm saying? It's like, ah. Uh, and so people ask, so how's it going? Well, how, how am I supposed to measure that? <laughs> you know? Because it's hard to judge how the kingdom of God is doing by what you see. It is. It is. It's hard to judge how the kingdom of God has done in the past two years going through a pandemic. I, I mentioned this before when I preached this. But maybe you noticed as well as I did, people's response to God has not been what I expected after going through a life-threatening pandemic. Now, I know we're, we're a little more educated on the, the death rate of the pandemic now as we were at the beginning, but it's still deadly. I was just talking to Helga, and uh, is it your, your nephew just passed away from COVID? And, and regardless of what we know now, we didn't know that in the beginning when everything hit and people were saying there's a deadly pandemic on the loose. Do you know what I expected to see in the kingdom of God during the past two years, exponential growth because life was being threatened. We know we didn't quite see that. It's hard to judge the kingdom of God by what you can see, isn't it? So how, how is God's kingdom doing? Let's just get to, the, let's get to the meat of the message. How is God's kingdom doing? And more importantly... What should we know about God's kingdom that will help us understand what it's really like in spite of how it sometimes appears? Friend, do not judge God's kingdom by what you see today. Here's why. Here's the first parable. Here's why. <clears throat> There's a time of reaping yet to come. Here's the first parable. It Read with me in verse 26. And he said, so is the kingdom of God. All right? So <clears throat> you, you can see Jesus is about to describe what the kingdom of God is like, right? Verse 26, he, he says, and, and he said, so is the kingdom of God. Verse 30, he says, and he said, whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like. So God's going to tell us what the kingdom of God is like. And in verse 26, he says, and he said, so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Because the harvest is come. You know what's coming? A harvest in God's kingdom. There's, here's why you shouldn't judge the kingdom of God by what you can see today. Because there's a time of reaping yet to come. That's why Jesus is giving this parable. Do you know what you learn from this parable? The seed must first be planted in the soil. <laughs> there's no harvest unless the seed gets planted. We covered that in the last in the last message, right? We start with planting the seed. Plant the seed. Plant the seed. Plant the seed. I, I mean, really, that's got to happen if this is going to be true. But if the seed has been planted, I can tell you what's coming, a harvest. You plant the seed now, a harvest is coming. Yeah, but when? I didn't say when. But a harvest is coming when the seeds are planted. But that's what happens in the story. First, the seeds are planted, and the seed grows in a certain order. I mean, even right here in the text, Jesus describes a farmer who plants a seed, and it says, first the blade, and then the ear, right? It's, it talks about how first you get a little bit, and then later on it grows into the stalk, and then you got the ear of corn, and it grows on from there, right? There's a process of growth. There's, there's a time of growth. First comes the planting of the seed, and then the seed grows in a certain order. And as the farmer goes about his life, the seed grows independently of the farmer. I love this. I love that my favorite phrase in this whole section comes in verse 27 at the end. It says, he knoweth not how. Here's what happens. <laughs> 
Here's a farmer, he gets the seed, he plants the seed in the ground. The next morning he comes and he waters the seed. And, you know, he's like, oh, look, we got some rain coming. Excited about the rain. So he goes and makes sure, makes sure the seeds don't get washed away and keeping the weeds out as best as possible. But other than that, that's it. That's What else are you going to do? <laughs> like, well, there it is. And the farmer comes out the next day and he's like, well, nothing's happened yet. So I'm going to go back about my business. I'm going to do life as I was always doing. And the farmer gets up one day, and as he makes his way out, there it is. There's a tiny little, there's a tiny little blade coming out of the ground. A little leaf has, has sprung up, and the farmer says, great. Now I'm going to plug in my power and make it produce fruit. No, he doesn't do that. Great, I'm going to take my scalpel, and I'm going to cut open the leaf, and I'm going to make the fruit come. No, he doesn't do that. He says, Awesome. <laughs> that's, all, that's it. That's all the farmer can done because uh, he's done his job and his job was to plant the seed and to water the seed. But I mean, other than that, the text gives the indication that the farmer just goes about his life continuing to do what he's supposed to do because he doesn't know how the plant grows. He just knows it's growing. That's all that happens. He just continues to go about doing what he should do and, and with this hope that there is a harvest coming. Now, the farmer doesn't come out and, and say, oh, there's a plant there, but, you know, I don't know if it's actually going to... What, what if this corn plant produces apples? <laughs> he doesn't do that. He knows it's a corn plant. It's going to produce corn. And he doesn't come out there and say, yeah, but I've planted a whole field of corn. What if none of it produces any fruit? Well, he doesn't do that. A farmer knows there's going to be lean times and strong times. But the farmer also knows the basic character of a corn, a, 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 a corn seed produces corn. <laughs> it's what it does. And God built it that way. And so when the farmer sees the seed pop through the ground, you know what he's thinking? I got a harvest coming. You got to get more excited about that than that. That's just not enough, Right? Look, maybe you're tired. I don't know that this relates to the kingdom of God. This is big news. This is good. Because when the farmer sees something coming out of the ground, he knows a harvest is coming. There's a harvest coming. I can't make it come. I don't know how it grows. But the Lord of the harvest has so designed that his seed produces fruit. Amen, Pastor. That's encouraging. <laughs> I needed that. Well, I did. I don't know if you did or not, but that's good news for me. The, harvest, the farmer anticipates the harvest day, but he can do little else. Man, that's a lot like church planting. Whew. When, we, when we got started, before we got started, I, I was at Wooden Valley and I had whiteboards. And I was like, right now in our game plan, you know, okay, we're gonna, here's how we're gonna attack the city. We're gonna divide it up into sectors. We're gonna do this and we're gonna hit this many homes and we're gonna have, and we did. Oh man, within the two weeks leading up, we, we door knocked for a while for like, you know, three, four months leading up to the starting of Foundation Baptist Church. But when the two weeks leading up, we did like 14,000 homes. We were crushing it. We were like everybody and their brother was helping us go pass out flyers and invitations. And, and I was writing on the board and this is what we're going to do. And we had meetings in the park like three or four times a week. And we were just crushing it. We had newspaper advertisements. We had special gifts. We had 50 helpers for the first day. 50 helpers. And then we had Doug and Linda <laughs> was our guest. 50 to help them. It was awesome, right? And, we're, 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 and we had all these big plans, and I had a five-year plan and a 10-year plan, and this is what it's going to look like. i tell you what's happened after 15 years. I've come to the realization, he knoweth not how it grows. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm happy to be a part of it, and I want to continue planting seeds, but you just can't make it grow. But it does grow. It does when you plant the seeds. It grows. Hmm. What's the objective then? Hang on, this is really deep. It's going to take a while to process this. Here it is. You ready? Plant the seed. <laughs> Isn't that deep? Plant the seed in the hearts of men. Yeah, but what else? <laughs> he knoweth not. You, you, you want me to get out the, the whiteboard again? And say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Look, we'll come up with ideas. We got our four goals for missions, right? Give, go, tell, serve. We're going to come up with ideas. Do you know how all that's going to work? 
I don't know. But if it helps us plant the seed, then I think we're doing the right thing. Because that's what we're supposed to do. Is plant the seed. Do you know what the Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 7, uh, 7 and 8? Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Look, as, just as the Lord's going to return and we must be patient for that, we also must be patient as the husbandman prepares to reap a harvest. Look, there's a harvest coming when seeds are planted. So you've got this job. Plant the seed. Plant the seed because a harvest is coming. There can be no harvest where the seed has not been planted. You cannot reap where you have not sown. But friend, just know <clears throat> that the fruit of your labor will not be seen immediately. There's a harvest coming. I... Someone told me, I think it's Caleb, said, Pastor, don't apologize for your illustrations. I love them. So, because at least he does, I won't apologize for the one you've heard a thousand times over. But I remember door knocking on, and, and you know, I've gotten lots of slam doors in my face, but never, never quite, <laughs> quite so astounding as when I knocked on the door of Briss out in Fall City. I knocked on the door, this, this old guy, 72 years old, he comes to the door, and he's got a gun in his hand. And he's, he's kind of pointing it at me like this. And he opens the door and says, what do you think it is like what? <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know what it was about that, you know. Everybody out here in the Northwest, everybody's passive aggressive. That was definitely not passive aggressive. That was very aggressive. But for whatever reason, that drew me to him. And it, it just kind of like, okay, I'd rather have it in my face than, than be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, great, thanks. You know, and <laughs> throw it behind my back. You know, he was, he was just in my face. And I'm like, well, I'm a pastor, and this is information about the church. I'd love if you could read it sometime. I don't want to go to church. And just, man, it's just rough. And, you know, came back the next week, just following the same thing. He opens up the door. You again. You know, it's like, I was, <laughs> just want to invite you to church, you know. And, and, you know, moved on. Clearly, that was a closed door. Or was it? I had planted the seed. He hung on to that for a year. And a year later, I got a call. And he answers the phone. He says, are you that preacher that came by my house a year ago and gave me that piece of paper with that information on it? I said, I remember you. Yes, yes, I was. And he says, well, I read it. <laughs> and he says, I need you to come over right now. And tell me how to do what it says, because I need it. And I came over to Briss's house, and I sat on his couch, and I got to lead him to Christ. He got saved. He got saved. I would have never in a million, billion years thought that man, that guy, would have got saved. But the seed is at work. I don't know how. I don't know how that works. But you plant it. And you give someone the truth of the gospel and it just begins to germinate and grow. He came to church. Some of you, I don't know if anyone is left here who remember. Oh, Doug remembers. He came to church and I'm preaching away in the lodge. I, don't think, I think he only came like once, maybe twice, once or twice. And he came and he sat in the back. He just hobbled in. I don't even know how he drove, but he, he got to church somehow. And right in the middle of my preaching, he starts waving his hand at me, and I'm pretending like I don't see him, you know. I'm just like, this is really weird, you know. And, and he told me before, it's like, I'd never been to church except for maybe a, a funeral and a wedding. That's it. He came, and it's his first time in church, church, and he's waving his hand. And I, I finally, I couldn't ignore him anymore. And it's like, yes, Chris. I'm like, oh, Lord, please help this go well. And he says, I can't believe I'm here, he said. He raised his hand. I can't believe I'm here. And I can't believe I'm even saying anything right now. But I just wanted to tell everybody here what he's saying is right. Because I did what he said. I'll never forget that. And he said, my life's changed. I just unbelievable. Friend, look, I know. I get it. Here's what we'd like to see. We'd like to plant the seed, go to sleep, wake up the next morning, harvest. It just doesn't work that way. You have to plant the seed with this knowledge. There's a harvest yet to come. 
There's a time of reaping yet to come. The seed, this is so important. Please, please absorb this truth. The seed's success does not depend on our feeble efforts. It's the seed that does the real work. We are the servants of God's kingdom, not its cause. It's the seed that does the work. It's John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You realize it's that truth that does the real work. It's not you. Well, God, need, God needs Pastor Matt. God needs Pastor AJ. God needs, God needs Aaron to play the piano and God needs Doug to count the funds. You know, all those things are helpful. Let's be clear about something. God does not need you or me. It's the seed that does the work. It's his truth. It's, it's him. He's the power. We're just the servants in the kingdom. It all relies on him. And he did something crazy. God said, I'm putting that power in your hand and I want you to cast it out. I don't know. Why do we have to be in the mix? <laughs> if a, a, a plan is only as good as its weakest link, why did God put us in the plan? I, it's, a, it's baffling to me, but we're in it. And he says, I'll do the work, but I'm putting the seed in your hand. Let's go plant the seed. Go plant the seed. Here's why you ought not to judge the kingdom of God by what you see today. Because there's a harvest time yet to come. Don't write off your labor for God by what you see today. I know sometimes it seems inconsequential today. But it's really just preparation for harvest later. God will reap the gospel seed that you have sown. I, I'm not going to, I'm barely going to have time for the second, but I got to tell you about Phyllis. I got to tell you about Phyllis. You know Phyllis. Some of you may. Ron and Valerie Johnson, man, they, were, they came, they, they cheered everybody up. They're, they're Baptocostals the whole time they were here, and they're just excited people, you know, and and Valerie's always taking notes with a smile on her face as I was preaching. And she had a mom, Phyllis. Phyllis was high class. Phyllis was a secretary uh, to the uh, uh, Bellevue College president, several presidents, as, as I understand. She was an upstanding lady in her community, and she, she served people. I mean, she really did. And boy, when, 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 when I was in her presence, I, I felt like, I was with the Queen of England. She just classy lady, you know, wouldn't have anything to do with the gospel. Wouldn't have anything to do with the idea that she was not good enough for heaven. Wouldn't accept that. My life's together. But boy, she had a daughter who loved her. And Phyllis and Ron, especially Ron. Ron was after her mother-in-law, uh, his mother-in-law, wanted her to get saved. Like, Pastor, would you pray for Phyllis? Would you go visit Phyllis? Would you talk to Phyllis? Pray for Phyllis all the time. And I, I would do my best, but she just, I mean, there was a line drawn. Like, when you've lived the, the life I've lived, then you can tell me what's wrong. I mean, that was kind of her attitude. One day she broke her hip, and she was in her 90s. She wasn't headed in the right direction health-wise. And so I broached the subject again. I tried to say, Phyllis, you know, you got, you got a daughter and a son-in-law who really love you, want you to know the truth. You know, if, you're, if, if, if you don't accept Jesus as your Savior, you cannot go to heaven. Boy, that conversation ended. But she moved from there, not long after that, into hospice. Now, time was just winding down. And Ron came to me one last time and said, would you go visit Phyllis, please? Just one more time. One more time. She's 92 years old. And I walked in there, and I sat down with Phyllis, and she was very frail. First time I'd ever seen her really frail. And we began to talk. And we talked and talked probably for 45 minutes to an hour. And I, had, I began to bring up the gospel. And I said, Phyllis, do you understand that you're a sinner? And for the first time, it began to break down. Do you understand that Christ died for you? And I went through the whole plan of salvation right down to Romans 10, 9, and 10 on how to accept Christ. And we get to that moment and instead of shutting me down, she would change the subject. And we'd talk for a little more and we'd circle back. We did that six times. 
Six times I went over and over and over until finally I said, Phyllis, look, I'm not trying to force you to believe this. I'm only offering it because I sense you need it and want it. But you know as well as I do, this will probably be our last time that we meet together. Phyllis, do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior? And she shook her head and she said, yeah. And I held her hand and began to pray. And she squeezed my hand and tears began to roll down her eyes. And Phyllis Hudson got saved at 92 years old. She got saved. And I got to bury her with the knowledge, I'm going to see her again in heaven. You know, 92 years is a long time to wait for a harvest. But if you sow the seed, there will be a harvest yet to come. And finally, quickly, <laughs> there's another parable here. I will give the summary of it in verse 30. And he said, where to shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So what does this say about the kingdom of God? Well, what we learn about the kingdom of God in this parable is this truth. The beginning is not a measure of the end. The first parable of the farmer indicated that you shouldn't judge the kingdom of God by what you see today because there is a harvest yet to come. But there's another reason not to judge the kingdom of God by what you see today, and that is this. The beginning is not a measure of the end. What you see today is not going to be what it's like in the end. Jesus does not compare the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, but to what happens to a mustard seed. In keeping with the farming analogy, you know what God does? He transforms a tiny speck of mustard seed like no other planted herb. That little mustard seed grows to a six to ten foot high shrub. That's pretty spectacular. I, my, my mom had a little brooch thing that she wore and said something um, along the lines of, uh, uh, it was a faith statement, like living by faith or something like that. And on, under it hanged this little vial with three little mustard seeds in it. And when she died, my dad said we could go and pick something out from her jewelry drawer. She didn't have a lot of valuable jewelry. But even amongst all the, the, the things that were valuable, that's what I wanted. It was completely worthless to anybody else. It was, it was just, you know, painted metal and plastic but it had a value to me way beyond anything else there because it represented my mom and her faith, those little mustard seeds, tiny little specks, like smaller than the head of a pin. And God takes that and you plant that in the ground and you'd never believe the end by the beginning. It's so transformed. The Bible says in this passage, not only is it transformed, but the fowls of the air come and lodge in its branches. How about that? Do you remember the fowls of the air in the morning message? You know what the fowls did? They ate the seed. The fowls were what ate the seed. The fowls <laughs> represented the powers of Satan. Do you know what happens after the seed grows? You'd never believe this, but some of the enemies of Christ become his servants. Some of those enemies become, uh, come to lodge in the branches of what grows out of the gospel. It's just like the Pharisees in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem great, greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient unto the faith. The priests of the temple, those who, the religious crowd who helped to crucify Jesus are now part of the church after the seed had grown and the gospel began to spread. Well, here's, here's the point. You cannot anticipate what the end will be like from the seed. You can't. So sow the seed. Sow the seed. What's the objective here? Well, here's the objective. If, if the objective on the first parable was this, plant the seed, the objective here is wait patiently. God's at work. Wait patiently. 
God's at work. It's almost like a song we sing. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. Wait patiently. Wait patiently. It's deceptively small beginning does not doom it to insignificance. Wait patiently. You'll be amazed at what God can do with those little seeds you sow. I know it may seem like the kingdom of God is insignificant in the beginning, but it's really not a reflection of where it will be in the end. After World War II, my grandfather, Carmelo Farinella, came back from the war in Sicily. All of Italy was pretty war-torn. People were hungry, jobless. The, the, uh, the Great Depression that hit 1929 here was hitting there in the late 40s in, in Italy in the aftermath of the war. There are no jobs to be found, no food to be found. Newly married man, he came back from the war looking for work. And he would travel by foot over the Sicilian hillside looking for work from town to town. And one day on his journey, he came across a little pea plant. As a hungry man on a journey looking for work, a wild pea plant would have made a quick and easy meal. But instead of eating that, he dug up that plant and he had a garden back home, nothing in it, but he had a garden back home and he thought, well, I could take this home, but if I do, it'll get robbed for sure behind my house because people are looking for food. So without telling anyone, including his wife, he dug up that pea plant and he went to a remote hillside in the Sicilian country and replanted that. And at night, he'd sneak out and he'd go cultivate himself a garden. And one plant became two and two became four and he began to replant that plant until it got large enough that he needed some help. And he went and he got my grandmother and said, Yolanda, I have a secret to show you. And he took her out there and there was a budding garden of peas. And over time, they began to cultivate those peas from that one wild pea plant until they had a whole harvest of peas. They took those peas in the town and they went and they bought a male and a female rabbit and they began to raise rabbits and peas. From those rabbits and peas, my grandfather bought boat fare for he and his wife and his kids to come to America. That's how they came here. And from coming to America, my uncle Saul was the first to get saved. My uncle Saul took the gospel to the rest of his family and they all got saved except for my grandfather. And from them, my dad, who is saved, came up to Washington to plant a church. And here we are today. I'm in America today because my grandfather took the tiniest of pea plants and replanted it to produce a harvest. Who would have ever thought that all this is because of that one plant? Can I give you the point of the parable so we can end? Don't judge the end of God's kingdom by the beginning. Don't do it. Well, then what should we do? Wait patiently. <laughs> God's at work. Wait patiently. God's at work. We don't live in a patient society, do we? <laughs> it's not very patient. We live in an age that doesn't lend itself to the patience of farming. We're always in a hurry. Sometimes we expect to plow the field, plant the seed, reap the harvest, thresh the grain, and bake the bread all in one worship service or in one conversation about Christ with a loved one. Don't we? We just want to plant the seed and go through the whole process and produce fruit right there. But it doesn't happen that way. And when nothing happens, we're tempted to feel as helpless as a farmer who can do nothing to produce a harvest but go about his life and be faithful to his work. But can I encourage you? The seed's at work. So wait patiently. God's at work. Don't judge the seed. Don't judge God's kingdom by what you see today. God is at work. Plant the seed. Wait patiently. 
God is at work. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I wonder if there might be some seeds that you have planted in your own life. Maybe in your marriage, maybe in your kids, maybe with your neighbors, maybe with your co-workers. Wait patiently. The seeds at work. You never know when God will produce a harvest. I had a co-worker of mine years ago before I got into ministry working at U.S. Sailor. He was totally crass and oblivious to anything I said about God until his brother attempted suicide. And I didn't realize that that whole time I was at that job planting seeds of faith into him that when crisis hit his life, he was ready to talk. I got to introduce him to our church and to a relationship with God. Friend, listen, wait patiently. God's at work. Let the seed do its job. Plant the seed. Wait patiently for God to work. Heavenly Father, I pray.